So, and now we have Tony Graham, and he will tell you something about how to implement loose leaf formatting, which is something very easy, I suppose, or maybe not, in CSS. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jörka. So this talk discusses an ongoing project that Antenna House is doing for a company called Unicode in the US. Uh, it's a loosely formatting project. How many of you have used loose leaf um, pages, documents before? A handful. How many of you have never heard of loose leaf? You have no idea what I'm talking about. Great, because I have some slides for you. <laughs> so, uh, oops. So I'll talk about the concept of loose leaf and why Municode are using it, and then I'll talk about the Municode project. It was a great project. It has elements of romance, intrigue, and murder. Oh, no, that was a different project. This one has editor customizations in it, some Schematron, which at least 60 of you are interested in based on yesterday. Uh, XSLT, of course, and most importantly, it, it involves making pages. So what is loose leaf formatting? So for loose leaf formatting, you have your printed document is maintained as separate pages, the leafs that we're talking about here. So before I get too much further, how many of you well, that put your hand up for the first question, when was the last time you actually had to work with the loose leaf uh, document to actually do the updates yourself? The last time I had to do it was in the mid-80s. Is anyone closer than that? When? Still going, yes. I mean, the one we're talking about here from Unicode is municipal codes, uh, the legal documents for municipalities in the US. So the present day, very good. So the document is maintained as separate pages. So when you update the document, you don't just format it and then print and send out a whole new copy of the entire document. Firstly, you, set, you, you send out just the changed pages. The person with the copy of the document has to take out the old version of the pages that have changed and then insert the new pages. This sounds very laborious, but I was thinking when I was preparing this, perhaps they could relabel this as sort of the new green publishing because you print far fewer pages and you send out far fewer uh, amount of paper to update a document. But then, that's all well and good if it's a static document and every page you have the same content on the same pages. But what happens when the page, when the pagination changes? Well, for the original copy of the document, there's no changes to worry about. So we have our original version. And then, we change the page. We might make, we might add some text to the first section, which was previously pages one and two. It's trying to show this here in blue. So in this diagram, page one and two are two sides of the same leaf, like page one with page two on the back. And everything is done in terms of an odd numbered page and an even numbered page. So if we add content, that pushes stuff from page two onto page 2.1. How many pages do you think we need to send out to update the document? Two, which two? Yes, because we can't just send out the back side of what's on page one. We have to send out a, a new page one, a new page two, as well as what's referred to as our point pages. When you get into loose leaf publishing, you'll also find that you can have point pages of point pages because you do the maximum you can to try to minimize the number of pages that you need to change. It's all part of the new green publishing that I'm talking about. And it reduces the frustration level of people who have to update these documents. So the, the take, as they say in Municode speak, is what you distribute. As we said, it's those two pages. And then suppose 
we make another update, and this time we've shown it in orange. Uh, and we push content onto page 2.2, and we've also changed the line. We found a typo on page three. So how many pages do we send out this time? Six? Why would we send out six? We didn't change pages one and two in this time round. We just send the changed pages, which is the new 2.1 and the new 2.2, as well as the new three and four. Now, I said we have point pages on point pages, but we didn't need to we just send a new revision of page 2.1 rather than making this 2.1.1 because we didn't change the actual number of pages. In real life, there'll be another little indication in the footer about which version of the page we're talking about. And in a real full list leaf document, there's something called the list of effective pages, which tends to be at the front, which is the complete list of what revision uh, each page should be up to in an up-to-date document. I'm not going to go into that today. So this is straight from the Municode requirements, what not to do when paginating, when taking takes. Uh, we should avoid point pages as much as possible. And the whole point of the processing is to make point pages, but we try to not do that. Uh, so as in that previous example, we, we keep the... 2.1 and 2.2 and try to avoid making 2.1 and 2.1.2. Uh, if we add a point page, we try and add it at the end, unless of course that is inconvenient if the next, if the, the next page of the book is a point page starting with one, we have to go look at the beginning. There's logic in the XSLT that I won't go into that handles all of this. And, sort of the Hail Mary pass. If you can't do it at the end, you can't do it at the front, then put it in the middle and it'll be fine. So the client for this project uh, is a company called Municode. Uh, which one was yours, David? who, in their terms, provide codification and other services to municipalities. Uh, part of this is the bylaws of a municipality, and um, they have an existing loose leaf system for this, and they're looking to uh, replace that with something that requires less human interaction, less authoring, and then going from an existing markup to or three in HTML5 so that they can use it for their ongoing web distribution as well. And they decided to do CSS formatting. And um, according to Elliot, they picked AH Formatter before he was on the project. And the initial development was done by Elliot Kimber. Many of you possibly know Elliot already. He's based in Texas, he went off this project to get a full-time job working in a, a data project. Uh, and when he was looking for someone to take over the project, Antenna House said, well, if you're using AH Formatter, we know more about how to get the best out of it than anybody. So we took on the uh, development. So after 17 hours of conference calls, I became the new Elliot Kimber. So uh, we have one, oh, 15 minutes. I can compress 17 hours into 15 minutes. Just hold on. <laughs> Many of the details are in a talk that Elliot gave last year at Balassage. I'm trying to sort of dovetail mine with his and not repeat much of what he said. Um, if you have time, go and read Elliot's paper for more of the XSLT details. Uh, you, well, you should read it anyway, because it says things about AH format of the device. Said it would sound like marketing, but it sounds better if someone else says it. Um, so why are Unicode doing loose leaf? Because their content, the bylaws, etc., update frequently. You might find that every council meeting, the councillors make some resolution which, gonna, which is going to affect the bylaws. Um, so the civic code could be quite a large... Um, document held in a binder. The staff are used to working with their um, 
paper copies. I mean, I can imagine there's copies in offices around the US for the different municipalities that are covered with post-it notes and scrawled things on the pages that haven't changed. Oh, they've made a note. And I can also imagine some clerk going, see this? That's in the rules. You can't do it. Try doing that with the PDF. So if you have loose leaf, it's impractical to send out your whole thousand pages. I mean, if you have a document like this, it's impractical to send out a thousand pages every, after every council meeting. Um, So they print and distribute only the change pages. As I've said, what they're working with for the system we're working on, it's a controlled subset of HTML5. There's some use of data attributes of various sorts to control the formatting. And they mark the changes where the change pages start and end with processing instructions. Uh, the, the name for the process instructions, instructions, as you can see, is PDF because it's all focused on the PDF production there. And they're very direct. It's, the PI is a PDF and the program they run to format the whole thing and generate a take is a file called ahf.bat because it's formatter that does it, that does it to PDF. So the data attributes, they have different ones for different uses. There's data type and data subtype, which sort of give extra hints about the structure that they're, they have in HTML, which reflects the structure of your average, if there is such a thing as an average uh, civic code. And then they have other data attributes, which basically override the default formatting. Um, you, I hope you're aware that in HTML you can have an attribute that starts with data and then something, and whatever you do, it's still valid for HTML. So you can put in your own data, whatever attributes of any type. So the, um, so these data break before, et cetera, look very arbitrary, I mean, see, but in some cases, they have to put them in to replicate what the previous system did. In some cases, the, a particular municipality might have their own conventions for uh, what pages happen where, um, when, when there's a page, a narrow page. You might have a large table that has to go on a, a tabloid page or a landscape page, and they would indicate that with these data attributes. So the PDF. Uh, markers mark the start and end of a take. They're added manually. The editors, as in the human editors, look at the document and look at the previous version and work out where the start of a change page would start. And they put in the PDF marker for the start and they would put a PDF in the marker for the end. I mean, it's tempting to think that we could automate this but then the rational part of my mind is quite happy that we don't have to automate this and have people to do it because the um, finding when to start and end isn't a trivial problem because things can start or end practically anywhere, including in the middle of a word. So there's an example here. Um, you, hopefully you can see we have uh, take begin, PI, which says where we're starting from. There's some text, and then uh, we, we're going to finish the change pages in the middle of a word. And if you look here, there's, there's even a pseudo attribute for, you're gonna have to stick in a hyphen at the end of the change page because the previous version broke in the middle of a word. And trying to automate that sort of thing, I'm, I'm glad we don't have to do it at this point. So I said earlier that we had this project included editor customizations. The human editors, just let me check my time. Human editors use Oxygen XML author with custom toolbars, limited menus, 
and uh, Muni Pub uh, menu for, for checking out jobs from their Git repository, the details of which are hidden from them. And then shortly afterwards, the people doing the development said, uh, we like the Muni Pub menu, but can, we need to put back everything else so we have full control for our editing. So uh, one quick email to Oxygen Support, and there was an answer for controlling this based on the Oxygen version. The CSS uh, is sort of broken up into yours, mine, and ours. There's a set of CSS files which are used with Oxygen. There's a set of CSS files which contain the print-specific stuff, which are done with which inclusion or in exclusion is partly controlled by uh, media queries, and then there's some common CSS which is used by both. I mean, partly this is because for authoring and um, print, the, the oxygen extensions don't really work for print, but also, um, oh, I'm ahead of myself. You can't see that at this resolution, but the oxygen framework that the, that's used for authoring calls in the oxygen-specific CSS files, and they're not used for print. The other reason for breaking these apart is that oxygen, when you're editing the CSS, it is a syntax-aware editor for the CSS. I realize you won't be able to read this at this resolution, but something from the print style sheet, this says side note is a CSS hack because it's an at side note rule. <laughs> um, I mean, that's a bit judgmental, if you ask me. But the problem is that AH format implements um, side note and implements a whole bunch of uh, formatter specific solution um, extensions. And if you're editing the oxygen style sheet, you don't want to get distracted by lots of red lines for the stuff that oxygen doesn't um, support, or doesn't need to support even. So you won't be able to read that either, but the side note is from an earlier uh, version of the GC generated content for page media CSS module. So it's not really the formatter made it up, it's just that it was taken out of CSS uh, in some earlier edit. There is, of course, uh, Schematron for validating things. The, th the, the good thing about data attributes is you can put in whatever you want and it's still valid HTML. The bad thing is you can put in whatever you want and it's still valid HTML, but it might not make sense to your processing. So the Schematron for checking the, the data attributes. Uh, you, in this case, we're checking that the header has uh, paragraph with a, attribute, has a data type attribute of start page. This is one of the conventions for uh, sort of putting in the start, the, the initial page number of a chapter or, um, in the HTML, which is then carried through to the processing. And if you can look through the angle brackets, there's also, of course, a schematron quick fix so that in the editor, uh, as well as getting warned about the problem, you can be told, or just insert a, click on this and we'll insert a page one for you. This schematron checking for the uh, PDF processing instructions because um, they can be quite complex and the schematron makes great use of the Saxon get pseudo attribute, uh, I guess it's an extension function, which parses the, the text content of the processing instruction and gets you a list of um, the things that look like attributes and the schematron checking for the start or take or has a corresponding end, except of course, if the end of the take is the end of the document, it could be omitted to make things easier. Uh, just for fun, well not really for fun, but I, I sort of did a, a budget processing instruction locator using schematron uh, so that in Oxygen, in the sidebar, you can enable the show PDF uh, phase. And you get a little blue bar for every 
um, PDF processing instruction in the Docker, which is useful for seeing what's there. Oh, I'm running out of time. That's actually just done with a schematron rule that matches on the processing instruction and creates the info. Uh, so it's not a warning, it's just information. And it shows up where you, alongside your schematron errors, your actual errors. The steps involved in the formatting, for most of this, you'd be better off looking at Elliot's uh, paper, which goes into more of these details. The HTML that's for source from the, that's, the source document is transformed for easier formatting. Sometimes with HTML, you need to duplicate content so that the content can be taken out of the flow and used in the headers and footers. This is format of the generate an area tree XML. It goes through the formatter and you get an XML representation of the formatted document. And then there's other XSLT which uh, adjusts slash mangles the uh, area tree XML and potentially reduces it to uh, just the pages that are contained in the takes that you want to do. And then that's formatted through the PDF. And as part of the sort of housekeeping, there's also a master record of the page numbers so you know exactly which version of the document uh, uh, each page is or should be. Some of this sort of extends the bounds of what you can represent in the CSS. So to get information from the HTML through the area tree, so it can be processed by the XSLT. Elliot sort of cheats, cheats a little, and he hides information in some of the unused page margin boxes in the CSS. I mean, well, in the, in the format of documents. So there's text hidden in page margin boxes that aren't used for visible parts of the headers and footers, and that's picked up by the XSLT to make decisions about the formatting and about what pages to, uh, to do. This is mostly, uh, it's partly for the housekeeping, partly because um, there's a particular problem with page numbers. In Municode documents, your uh, page might have, well, it might be the page number, there might be what's called the prefolio, some sort of prefix for the chapter because a feature, common thing in loose leaf documents is that there's per chapter page numbering and uh, there tends to be a, a prefix for each chapter so you can't, you, so you can look through the, um, look at the page numbers and work out which chapter you're actually in. And at different times, some pages and uh, numbers are represented as digits, some as lowercase Roman, uppercase Roman. Um, uppercase, lowercase text. The problem with P CSS is that in CSS, your page number is just a CSS counter, which the same sort of thing is used for numbering list items, etc. It just happens to be a well-known name that's predefined for you and gets incremented for each page. And in CSS, if you want to get a page number reference, you can refer to the page counter but if you want to format it differently, you have to know what the counter style of the page that you're referring to. And if you've gone from the HTML through the area tree, you've lost that information. So part of what Elliot hid in the page margin boxes is extra information about the page numbering. In my one remaining minute, uh, a little bit about page layouts in the, the, what's referred to as the legacy um, formatting in Municode, they have most things are portrait pages on eight and a half by 11, the most common page size in the, in the US. For some reason, some pages are done as narrow with extra margins. They tend to put narrow pages as the first um, page in the chapter and then go into wider margins for the rest. I think it's to sort of break it into you gently what you're doing. Sometimes you need a, la a landscape page rotated for wide tables, et cetera. And for really wide content, they have tabloid pages, which are eight and a half by 14. 
some of the data type attributes I showed you before, part of the processing is to select a particular page type. And sometimes we have overrides using the data page layout attribute. Uh, so this is just an example of a particular data type selects a particular named page. In this case, uh, this is something else that was in GCG, in the CSS module that's since been taken out. If you put multiple page names in there, the first page will be use the part named page, and the second page will, and subsequent pages will go onto the portrait page. For data page, PG layout, we can uh, select a, a particular named page, and this is about the only use of the important override in the CSS. And this can happen on arbitrary elements, but as we said, pages, you can't sort of separate the left, the front and the back of a page, so tabloid pages always have to uh, start on an odd-numbered page, a right-hand page, and have to make an even number of pages. There's a whole bunch of page rules. Uh, if you, if you, here's an example from the, the basic, sort of the master page layer, where our default page size, that would be the, the margins for your portrait page. And here's an example of what happens in the bottom left-hand corner, page margin box, Elliot's hidden uh, the actual page number. And a, a hack for debugging is you can change it from white to, to red so you can see it in your debugging printouts. So in conclusion, loose leaf challenging, loose leaf formatting has its challenges. The HTML and CSS made, makes the author easier, makes it easier for reuse on the web. But some things about CSS and trying to get it through the area tree and process it afterwards uh, are a bit challenging. Um, the whole system works with XSLT working on the area tree XML. But as I've shown, Elliot had to exploit some of this, what would otherwise be vacant page margin boxes. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Tony. And we have time for a question before coffee. So anyone over there? Thank you. Um, Tony, I obviously hate to ask this question because I love print and I've been in print and typography for many, many years. But given how complex that solution is, as you describe, how difficult it is to maintain for those injecting these marks into the data, how manual it is for the people who then insert pieces of paper into the civic code, do you see any future for, for loose leaf? Because if the only use case is that you can bash a piece of paper down and say it's not allowed, <laughs> then a computer says no. It's more than a way. Well, uh, I think people, people have been writing off loose leaf for decades, really. Um, it probably won't go away. I have actually looked at the Municode website last week, and I couldn't find a mention of loose leaf. So it could be the legacy systems that um, are doing this, but they, they have enough legacy people using this that they're still able to replace their existing system, and they think that's cost effective, rather than just um, continuing with the old one and paying maintenance on something, or just canceling the whole thing. So it's been written off before, but I can't say whether or not it will die, or I can't, it probably won't flourish, but it probably won't die. Okay. Um, hello. 
Um, uh, you mentioned uh, the complexities, and um, I remember having seen that in the 90s, that creating the instructions for the users, receiving updates to the Lucive pages is in itself complex, yes. if you want to automate something. But my, my question is, and I might have missed something in the talk, you mentioned these rules, uh, avoid this, avoid extra pages, put them where you want, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I'm coming coming from automated publishing, this is just a, a wish list, uh, but w when, if the content uh, appears at a certain, additional content appears at a certain place that will be put automatic, automatically on a certain page and then uh, you don't have any choice. Is that the reason that these processing instructions are inserted manually to give someone a chance to kind of follow these avoid rules? Uh. Well, firstly, the processing instructions are inserted manually because, well, firstly, firstly, because that's the way they've always done it. First, the second, firstly, is we don't have a better method at present. Um, there's a Delta XML sales person who was chomping at the bit to try and tell us that um, it's possible to automate this, but we're not at that point yet. And uh, the XSLT for, for doing that, like put it at the end if you can, but if you don't, that works quite well. Um, I didn't show you some of the other extra pseudo attributes that can go in the, the take begin, which will tell you what the previous page number is. And um, because the other thing I haven't mentioned with the loose leaf is that you can a change can also take content out. So sometimes you have to put in blank pages and there's extra pseudo-attribute fields in the uh, take begin which can give you those hints. So uh, that part of the processing works yeah, okay. better than it's, you might expect. Okay, it was more a challenge for my brain to go back into pre-automated mode. So, yeah. come, understood. Okay, so thank you very much, Tony, again. Thank you. And uh, before the coffee break, there is an important announcement. Uh,